Good afternoon, everybody. Continue our my tradition of uh, universities. Uh, today I have Wright State University. Um, our sister-in-law, Bethine, uh, graduated from Wright State, and uh, one summer, uh, Fran uh, took a couple courses there when we were both home for the summer in Greene County, and uh, we were both students at Miami University. Uh, that was uh, in the early, early days of, of, of Wright State. Uh, in Greene County, we're fortunate we actually have four, uh, excuse me, five, four additional besides Wright State. We have five uh, universities uh, in, in the county. Let me uh, give a little shout out here. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, things on, uh, a lot in the social media that uh, children, families are uh, displaying rainbows uh, as a sign of, of hope. Some do it with sidewalk chalk, uh, homemade artwork, other materials that, that you can find at your home. And as Fran uh, told you all the other day, she does have a recipe for the sidewalk uh, chalk paint. Uh, I got a chance to see that uh, the other day with uh, what some of our grandkids uh, had, had done. Um, you can find that on uh, Fran's, Fran's webpage, the recipe for that. We know uh, that during this time of uh, remote learning that families and teachers are looking uh, for educational activities that kids can do at home. Uh, the Ohio State Fair has partnered with the Ohio Department of Education to facilitate educational, uh, family, family friendly arts opportunities for students and adults statewide with what they're calling crafted opportunity. Uh, this is kind of a takeoff of the TV show that, that Chopped uh, where they give the chefs a, kind of a basket full of food uh, and things, and then the chef has to make something out of that. Uh, well, it's kind of the same way with uh, this crafted. These are all things that you can find uh, in, in your home, and it's kind of a competition, things such as paint, rocks, magazine sticks, uh, uh, even something like dried pasta, food containers. Uh, children are being invited to participate in this. Ohio teachers uh, really can take this uh, opportunity as an option for their students as an art project while doing remote learning. Uh, as, a, as a bonus, 10 random winners from each grade division, that's K through five, six through eight, and nine through 12, and also college slash adult, uh, will each win a VIP family uh, four pack to attend the next Ohio State Fair. Uh, including one parking pass, four mission passes, and four round trip sky glider passes. Uh, you can find more on Facebook, uh, on Ohio State Fair's uh, Facebook page. I want to talk uh, about some Medicaid uh, waivers that we're requesting. Um, last uh, week, I told you about some of the emergency measures that the Ohio Department of Medicaid has taken to help increase access to care for millions of Ohioans. Uh, they've waived prescription copays, uh, removed in-network and out-of-network pharmacy distinctions, and relaxed prior authorization requirements for most procedures. Uh, today, we are going uh, another step. Uh, our administration is submitting its first waiver application to the federal government, which is known as 1135 or Appendix K application to provide needed flexibility to address this crisis. Among other things, this waiver will allow us to do the following. One, uh, bolster telehealth and other technology to be used to do health assessments and care planning. Uh, second, waive signature requirements for a variety of providers to ensure safe distancing without compromising access to care. Uh, three, uh, ease obstacles to access nursing home care. Four, allow services to be provided at alternative locations. And five, removing staffing level requirements to give providers uh, more flexibility to deliver the services. Uh, once we get federal approval of this waiver, uh, which we hope we will, uh, it will uh, go back retroactively uh, from March 1st, 2020. 
Uh, removing restrictions like these during this pandemic will allow healthcare workers to focus on meeting the needs of their fellow Ohioans. Um, and uh, our director, uh, when we get to questions, uh, will be on the line. Uh, Marine Corcoran will be on the line if anyone has any specific questions about uh, that, that waiver. We're very fortunate today uh, to be joined by Mayor Andy Ginther. I don't know whether, Andy, you're up there yet or not, but you will. Andy, how you doing? Mayor? Doing, doing great, Governor. Good to, good to see you. Um, good to see you. The, the mayor uh, has, is in our call every day at, at 1130, uh, where we talk to many of the mayors of, of, of the state. And I just want to thank uh, Mayor Ginther, but also every uh, other mayor, uh, big and small size communities, because they've been very, very helpful as we as we go through this. Uh, they've been kind of our eyes and ears out there and reporting what what they're seeing, what we can do better, what we're not doing well. Uh, and these conversations are are really very, very helpful. Uh, I know to me, and I think they're probably also uh, uh, I'm sure helpful to the people of the state of Ohio, and that we come up with 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 better better policies. Uh, the mayor and I first. Uh, we've worked together on a number of things over the years, but uh, probably the most difficult thing we, we had to work on uh, was the Arnold Classic. Uh, and Mayor, that was not an easy uh, decision for any of us. Uh, and it was early on in this uh, epidemic. And uh, you know, we had to make the decision not to have spectators uh, there, which was uh, a very, very difficult uh, decision. Um, the mayor's going to uh, talk about anything he wants to today, but one of the things I know he's going to talk about is kind of the, the build out uh, as we work to make sure that we have the hospital capacity uh, in, in the state of Ohio. And, and Mayor, before, before you talk about what you're doing, uh, I just want to read through uh, what some other communities are doing. Um, um, in Cleveland, uh, Case Western University's health education campus uh, is the place where that build out is occurring. Uh, the Duke Energy Convention Center is where it is in Hamilton County. Uh, those, those two coupled uh, with the Greater Columbus Convention Center in Franklin County are where you're going to see, are seeing activity go on uh, just to make sure uh, that this uh, epidemic does not flood our uh, hospitals to the point where they no longer have space. Uh, candidly, we hope we never have to use these. Um, and the good work that all the citizens of Ohio are doing is really, really making a difference. Uh, the other locations uh, that we talked about, uh, we announced in the location of three additional sites, uh, and we're really holding these in reserve uh, if they should be needed. This is Seagate Convention Center. Uh, in Lucas County, the Dayton Convention Center in Montgomery County, and Cavelli Convention Center in the Mahoning uh, County as well. Uh, healthcare regions in Southern Ohio and Southeast Ohio have determined the existing hospital facilities in their areas will, with, with additional equipment, be able to handle the surge in patients without going to an off-site uh, location. So, Mayor, uh, we'll, we will turn it over to you. How are, how are things going in that regard? And, Anything else you want to share with uh, with us today? Well, thank you, uh, Governor, for the chance to, to join you and share with you uh, an update on the Alternative Care Center here at Columbus. The president of our Franklin County Commission, John O'Grady, and I had the opportunity to tour the site uh, yesterday, and just an incredible example. We, we call it here in Columbus and Central Ohio the Columbus way, because we believe we do public-private partnerships better here than anywhere in the country. And so to have four uh, health systems, the three adult systems in consultation with our nationwide children's hospital to come together uh, to help stand up in a two-week period, uh, a thousand bed alternative care center is pretty unprecedented. In fact, we're getting calls from uh, communities around the state and the country on how we've gone about this. And it's an incredible leadership of Ohio Health and Ohio State, uh, Carmel, 
And we uh, are really proud of the work that's been done here. And I got to tell you, Lieutenant Colonel Buchanan has been outstanding. The National Guard, in partnership with the city, the county, and the state, uh, have uh, made uh, a Herculean effort here. And I think we're well prepared. Based on the proposed number of cases uh, being much lower than originally anticipated because of the bold, courageous decisions made by you and Dr. Acton with stay-at-home orders and social distancing. Our, our greatest hope and goal, uh, probably our greatest victory as a community, is if we never had to open the alternative care center. But it is incumbent upon us as leaders to be prepared for that and want to make sure that we're protecting the health and safety of our residents here in Central Ohio. And, uh, the mayor is working with you and your team uh, to set these sites up throughout the state. You know, one thing that we have been reminded of during this crisis is how that Columbus Way is so important. You know, collaboration and focusing on the common good. Uh, you've talked at length about the incredible leadership of Lou Bonther and his colleagues at Patel, uh, you know, with Mike Kaufman at Cardinal Health, Abbott Labs. Uh, Ohio State, you know, three companies here locally, I see 3D and Rogue that pivoted from their traditional manufacturing and production to helping to produce PPEs for our uh, frontline healthcare workers to protect them. Uh, Middle West and Watershed moved from making spirits to hand sanitizer, again, for our frontline workers, our police officers, our our firefighters. So we're really, really proud of the way that Central Ohioans, uh, Buckeyes across the state, uh, have really taken to heart their personal uh, role and responsibility in helping us slow the spread uh, and let our frontline workers uh, do their jobs uh, and help serve the people of this community. Obviously, uh, cities. Uh, particularly our metro economies throughout the state that help drive the economy of the state, uh, are looking forward to the future and the reopening of our city. Uh, but I have to echo what the governor and Dr. Acton and Dr. Roberts has said here locally that we have to uh, really be listening to our, our doctors, our medical experts, our public health leaders to make sure that we open gradually and thoughtfully. One of our greatest uh, restaurateurs and native sons, Cameron Mitchell, has said, and I've heard this echo from businesses uh, across the community, that they have the wherewithal and the capacity to reopen once. And so we must be very thoughtful uh, and uh, reflective in making sure we're following the lead of our medical uh, and public health experts uh, to make sure that we do this the right way uh, to avoid, uh, you know, a second surge or other things in the future. You know, we've got to maintain our, our good hygiene practices and social distancing that is shown to be so effective thus far with slowing the spread. And I know it's hard. Uh, it's been hard on, on families throughout the state. We know many people in our community are suffering. Uh, we know the disproportionate negative health impact on African Americans here in Columbus and across the state. Uh, you know, these health disparities during a health crisis like this really come to light. So continuing to focus on those disparities and knowing that there are people right now in our community uh, and in communities around the state that are suffering. Uh, so with this recovery, we have to be mindful. It isn't just the public health crisis. There's going to also be a human service uh, crisis uh, and then uh, a recovery. And so knowing that there's not an even tidy start and stop to those, all three things may very well be happening uh, at the same time. But if we don't handle the public health crisis, the other two really uh, cannot be addressed. And so I just want to thank the governor, Dr. Acton, uh, Dr. Mashika Roberts here on a local level continuing uh, to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to slow the spread, listen and follow, you know, our medical experts, the, the leaders of our health systems, uh, and understanding that the best way to reopen the economy and to bring back a 
of recovery throughout the state uh, is to make sure we deal with this health crisis that stands before us. Well, Mayor, thank you very much. That is uh, inspirational uh, and hopeful. Uh, but it's also, I think you laid out uh, very well, really what our charge is and kind of the challenges that, that we, we face. And I, I personally look forward to continuing to work with you and the other mayors around the state uh, in, in, your, in that partnership. It's been a great partnership and um, so far so good in the sense that we've been able to slow this, this uh, put this curve down. Uh, and now, we've, now we're planning to how we how we start back up. So look forward to working with you, Mayor, and we Thank you. congratulations to you and your team for putting that uh, together in two weeks. That's quite amazing. Uh, as you say, let's, let's hope we don't have to use it. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. We appreciate it. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you very much, Governor. And it's great to have the Mayor uh, with us. We really appreciate the support that, that we've had from all the local officials across the state as we uh, try to confront the issues that are affecting all of our constituents uh, across our communities. One of the things that I wanted to do today is give a report on some of the some of the tools that we've implemented over the course of the last few weeks to, to help you know how well they're working and what the results of those efforts are. Let me start with the Dispute Resolution Commission. Uh, you recall that under the stay-at-home order there was a provision that, that called for the operation of essential businesses that are operating under a sets of practices that they need to operate under. These are enforced at the local level by the health departments, but on occasion there will be a business that operates or a similar type of business that operates in one community and another community and the health departments have different uh, conclusions about whether those are essential or not. So we established the Dispute Resolution Commission to try to address those issues. So far, they have had 194 inquiries. Uh, 142 of those w w did not meet the criteria for the commission so that those were best addressed at the local level. The commission uh, allowed those uh, the, the local rulings to stand uh, uninterrupted. There are currently 27 of these under review. So 194 overall, 142 didn't meet the criteria, 27 under review, uh, 15 that there was a conflict, but it ultimately got resolved at the local level, so the commission didn't need to make a ruling. And then there were 10 that were investigated where the commission did rule, uh, and, and examples of those were CBD uh, uh, establishments, pet grooming, and car washes. Those are kind of kind of fit the, the bill for what uh, the commission uh, ruled and all of that information is available on the website with the minutes and the rulings from the Commission so that it's transparent and you know how that process is working. And if you have questions, uh, want to make an inquiry, inquiry about the Dispute Resolution Commission, that's available at coronavirus.ohio.gov and it's under the Resources tab there. Uh, and you can find more information about it uh, as, uh, at that location. Additional a resource that was created, the Office of Small Business Relief. As you know, the state has done a number of things, everything from uh, moratoriums on foreclosures to insurance grace periods to BWC rebates, uh, that the Small Business Administration has disaster relief loans and payment protection uh, program loans that are available. And many of those loans, by the way, as a reminder, are forgivable under the PPP plan. So it's something worth uh, looking into. Encourage you to do that through your local financial institution that you have a, already have a relationship with. But the small business uh, assistance, uh, small business um, relief assistance office has helped 1,300 businesses so far. And if you would like. Uh, to find more information, it's coronavirus.ohio.gov slash business help. Most of the information you'll need, you won't need to talk to anybody. It'll be right there at that website address. Frequently asked questions and the answers to those should be there for you. But if not, if you go all the way to the bottom, uh, you will see that there's a place where you can email or call uh, there at the Office of Small Business Relief. So those two things are functioning, serving people. And, uh, and we encourage you to use them. Uh, additionally, 
Uh, one of the things that, that we are getting lots of calls on, I, I listened in on the economic advisory phone call this morning uh, to hear what businesses who are involved with that were saying. Uh, we understand, we wanna make sure you understand that, that we are taking the advice of businesses too. We wanna to hear what they have to say, uh, that there are many people who care about this, not just from a business point of view, but, but when we get through this, you wanna know that you have a place to come back to work to and that that will be safe and that the customers will be safe when they go there. And we're talking to large and small businesses diverse geographically, every, everywhere from West Central Ohio up to the lake, uh, all around the state, we're hearing, in some cases, from a variety of industry groups, restaurants, manufacturers, retail, recreation, people who are seeking more certainty about their future. We're listening, taking advice, and, and trying uh, to put a plan together to help give you the answers that you need. We know, because we get this question a lot, when, I always get that question, when is this going to be over? Don't we all wish we knew the answer to that? We, we do um, wish we knew the answer to that. And, it's, and there, will be a, there are a lot of factors that go into that, and, and the governor, I know, will be covering them uh, in the coming days. But the more important question that often gets discussed on these business calls is how. Not the when, but the how. How do we prepare ourselves to go forward, and as it's been said many times uh, at this news conference, it's not gonna be a light switch. Uh, it's going to be uh, a slower process, a, an incremental rollback, but these are the things that the businesses are sharing, and I, I say this so that other businesses who are out there who maybe aren't essential right now as it's deemed under the order, that you will know what businesses who are successfully operating, not just in Ohio under that essential business operation, but also some of our corporations who have operated globally in places like China and Italy and have done it successfully. So we have evidence of how this can be done successfully and the businesses are putting these protocols together, these best practices to not only share with us, but to share with each other so that when you return, uh, when you have that opportunity uh, and that we want to get the economy moving down the runway towards takeoff, that employees will know, because these are important. Building confidence is incredibly important. We want the employees to know that the businesses that they go back to are practicing safe business practices so you can feel confident as a member of that workforce to be able to do that uh, and, uh, and that it's safe. And we also want this for their customers. That's what businesses want. They want their customers to feel safe and that's another reason that they that they see this is so important for them to do. So remember, think about this as a business out there. You need to plan for that future. Uh, there are a number of things that you will need to source from cloth masks to uh, disinfectant to making sure that you have the structure within your organization where someone's in charge of, of making sure that these protocols are followed. You may need to reconfigure your business in some way so that it is, uh, it is designed to create the spacing that you need between employees to make it um, a, a, uh, a safe workplace to operate in, and then you have to have the strategy to implement it. And, uh, and those are the important factors to consider. And we were in this call today with many of what those, many of those essential employers, and I will remind, I will use this as an occasion to remind folks that from hospitals to nursing homes to food, uh, food services industry, to that supply chain, to manufacturing. Everybody that's, there are still a lot of businesses that are out there operating to try to serve us, and they're all using these safe uh, practices that were outlined in the, in the order that uh, the governor uh, uh, put together in Dr. Acton sign. And there are 667 employers out there in that critical area with 41,367 job openings right now. They have created safe workplaces for you, safe environments for their customers, and, and, uh, and we need you, if you can answer the call, uh, to, to work, go to work with one of those companies because those services are critical to, to being able to deliver uh, all that we need and consume uh, during this difficult time. And, and we appreciate all of the feedback that we're getting on these issues, I want to, one of the things that the governor always prides our team on is that we listen. We're good listeners. We try to, to try to seek input from everywhere we can to make good, sound decisions, and, and that's the approach 
that, that we are taking as this move forward. So thank you, Governor. Lieutenant Governor, thank you. Dr. Acton. Thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, it, it's good to see you here again. I know um, we are living that Groundhog's Day, and I, I wanna say that I do feel a little bit, myself even, of some of the frustrations at times, um, the not knowing, the tolerance for ambiguity we have talked about. We know that we're in that sort of flat spot right now, at the top of our peak, our first peak, hopefully the biggest thing we'll face but I, I know it's hard to keep doing what you're doing, and I wanna talk a little bit about that. But first of all, let's take a look at the numbers today. Um, we do now have 7,280 cases in Ohio, and a total in Ohio of 324 deaths. We did see, um, I believe, approximately 50 deaths just in the last day. We have cases now in 86 of our counties of 88. Um, and I realize this is tough because as we are really relieved that we have peaked at a really steady low level that's not overtaxing our hospitals, all in part, in all really in due part to you and the work you're doing and, and the the resiliency you're showing in holding out and continuing to do the social distancing. We do know that um, there are a lot of losses and there's a lot of sickness going on. And so I just want to acknowledge that these are, are still really tough times for, for many out there. Um, next slide. Again, we've done 67,000 tests over that in Ohio. Um, and our stats are pretty much holding the same in terms of age ranges and the distribution of who's getting sick. Obviously, we continue to see, next slide, um, our trend's pretty steady with the exception, you know, and we're gonna have these spikes, we're gonna have bad days and good days, and we're, we're really looking for trends, we're looking for directional trends. We really need um, to move forward you know, and make the next set of decisions we need to make, we're really needing to see those trends stay down and stay steady for a sustained amount of time. Next slide, please. I just wanted to remind everybody about high-risk categories. And of course, we've talked a little bit about vulnerable populations, the homeless, folks that are living in congregate settings. Um, but also, I just want to talk about the risk factors for each of you. Now, remember that anyone can really have, even a healthy person, a difficult time fighting off this virus. But certain folks are more at risk. Again, chronic lung disease, that's people with COPD, asthma, people who smoke or are exposed to higher levels of pollution. We're now seeing that that is a risk factor. Um, asthma, heart conditions, people who are immunocompromised for a variety of diseases or on cancer-treating drugs. Um, obesity itself. Um, is a risk factor, diabetes, kidney disease, and liver disease. This is what we know so far from the science. Obviously, aging, more at risk for any disease you're fighting off. So, you know, we know that um, there's prevalence, if not for us, uh, for those we love. And so we're doing a lot to keep those folks safe as well. Next slide. Okay. So I want to talk about a new order that has been issued and again, in partnership uh, with our mayors and listening to the needs at the local level, as well as with our frontline responders, we know how essential it is to protect our EMS, our firefighters, uh, the folks who are first on the scene. I wanna add in the State Highway Patrol, their new group that's particularly near and dear to my heart. And it's really important with the lack of PPE we have, the, the protective gear, that we're protecting those frontline workers who are often responding when someone is not doing well. Part of this order is that we are sharing more widely, but in a very confidential way, um, the addresses of folks who are cases. And this order protects that as confidential information for our dispatchers to make sure that folks are properly protected um, when they're transporting someone who may have COVID-19. I do want to add, though, and this is very important, so for our frontline responders, 
remember that anyone might be carrying the disease. Even someone who has recovered can still be potentially shedding the disease. It's so important, and as we move forward, we're gonna be talking about universal masking, but you have to assume, even as a frontline responder, I wanna know that you have at least this. Um, I know you're gearing up extra for certain circumstances and you're trying to save and conserve that gear, but everybody should have this. And for those of us who are at home, um, making them, finding one, even a simple bandana or a scarf, there's lots on our website, but we really have to protect each other. And I'll be sharing more in days to come how I wanna make sure that every Ohioan has, has this kind of mask available to them, that no one's left behind. So there is an EMS order that was issued today. Now I wanna talk, we're gonna be talking a lot more, but I know in the media there's much discussion about the plans. We're making a plan here in Ohio. We've been working on it for weeks, not just on the recovery phase, but we've also built out, as Mayor Ginther talked about, and, and the governor as well, just an unprecedented level of partnership between our hospitals, our nursing homes, and others in our community, especially our local health departments, and how we respond to what we expect to be ongoing hotspots and flare-ups throughout our state. The way I talked to Johns Hopkins, um, a colleague there who helped write one of the suggested plan sort of elements. We've been studying every possible plan and guidance out there. Um, and he said, Ohio should be tremendously proud. We really, really um, have been a leader and we've won the first battle in a war. We've won the first battle. I think one of the things that's hardest for me, and I know it's hard for you out there, is that this is a war. We have won the first battle, but we can't stop there. This is a longer road, and there are other battles yet to fight. So we continue to build, just like the convention center, but other spaces. We have to have our capacity ready in our hospitals, because we're hearing now from the scientists that we could see ongoing spikes until we have a vaccine. We are building out our emergency command to deal with those spikes and come alongside locals to help in any way we can. But most of all, we continue to look to you. As we talk about the very slow, gradual, responsible walk to opening up some parts of what we do, doing that very responsibly, and you'll hear more about that, the same things we've been doing matter more than ever. Um, my old boss, uh, Doug Kreidler, from the Columbus Foundation, wrote a column in the dispatch, and he used the words, you know how we've been saying it's not really social distancing, it's physical distancing. Uh, but he talked about social yearning in a time of physical distancing. Um, and he talked about the arts and the way they can help soothe us. I can tell you that I myself, over Easter weekend, had my first time standing outside. And I came home to my house during all of this and found four of my close friends wearing masks, very socially distanced, planting some pansies in my yard. And I talked to them at a distance and it was the first conversation with them I'd had in months. Um, and I realized over the holiday and when the holiday ended that I was feeling all the same Groundhog Day feelings again. The anger, the frustration, the despair. Why don't we know more? Why do we still have to learn so much more to have the answers we want to give you? How much more do we have to tolerate of this? And I just want to acknowledge that all of us are feeling this. It's such an unprecedented time that is asking a sort of a marathon of response from us. So we're gonna have good days and bad days. We're gonna have anger. We're gonna wanna give up and just hope that it could go back to the old way it was. And we know that we're moving into a new world. It isn't the old way. But we're moving forward. And we're gonna move forward together. And we're gonna move forward smartly in this state. But I wanna share with you that um, there is a song out there um, it was on the Colbert first show, he first revealed it, uh, by Michael Stipe of REM, wrote a song called, There's No Time for Love Like Now. 
And it was one of those bittersweet songs that remind me that I have to dig deep over and over again and again to feel that love. And so I hope you'll take a look at that song. It's something that's helping me stay connected during this time. Thank you. Dr. Acton, thank you very much. We will take some questions. Again, for those of you who are at home, uh, what we're looking at is a TV screen. And I see Jim Otte coming up here. He's everybody in the press corps, it looks like. Uh, media has a, a mask of some sort on. Mr. Otte has his. Is that homemade, Mr. Otte? Yes, sir. That's my bandana, sir. All right. Very good. You get the first question. Jim Otte from WHIO-TV. Thank you, Governor. Uh, for those people who are still waiting for their unemployment checks to come, uh, perhaps this is a question for the Lieutenant Governor. I speak on behalf of the people at Bill's Donuts in Centerville, Ohio. 50 people applied for unemployment after being laid off, although at this point only four have received anything. I wanted to know if you can, whether this situation or any others, discuss the, dis the disparity here about the timing of when their checks might come. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Uh... It's frustrating. I've had uh, Bill's Donuts uh, a number of times, and, and we look forward to having them again. Um, look, we apologize uh, to those 46 folks there. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor and I were talking about this literally before we walked in, and we're going to be continuing to talk with our team about it uh, at our 5 o'clock uh, call today. So I'll. I'll refer it to the Lieutenant Governor, but l let me just say this is something that is, is very concerning. Uh, it's very upsetting to me. Um, and, you know, we can go through all the reasons why that is happening, but the bottom line, uh, for those of you who are not getting your check or you didn't, weren't able to get in, into the system, uh, I don't think you want to hear anything. I think what you want us to do is fix it. And I hear you. And, Lieutenant Governor hears you, and we're going to do everything we can to fix it. I, I, I can, first of all, everything the governor said, absolutely right. Uh, this is, every time I hear a story about this, I, I just get even more frustrated um, because uh, it's not acceptable. And it's not acceptable on a number of levels because we understand that people are struggling and this is a difficult time, and we feel the responsibility to serve them. And when they're not getting served, uh, I'm not satisfied. I, I, I will have a fuller answer to this question tomorrow because I wanted to have it today, but I didn't feel like I got sufficient answers, and so I couldn't answer it today. Um, I. I'm, when I get into a situation like this, I always think about a quote from my college football coach where he used to say, don't tell me how rough the sea is, just bring the ship in. And that's how I feel about it. I, don't, I know there are reasons. I don't want excuses. I just want us to double down our efforts to innovate, to get tough, to dig down, and remember that we're getting this fixed. We can serve people. And until that happens, we're not going to be satisfied. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Hi, this is Molly Martinez with Spectrum News. My question is for Dr. Acton. Dr. Acton, we talk a lot about the long haul and you know how we're all sort of in this marathon, but for children, time feels a lot longer just because they've had less of it. What would you say to the kids who are sort of stuck at home and don't really understand what's going on and how long this is gonna last? I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, I have a grandson. He's not quite old enough yet to understand. But I've been thinking about, even when I'm talking to my older children, um, with young children, a friend of mine yesterday sent me some pictures. Uh, his mom is, the mom is in an essential business and is working extraordinary hours. And dad is at home trying to make become a school teacher, become an explainer to, you know, and, and their life is upended and she was drawing artwork that showed, she said, daddy, we can do this. And he was just so sad and mom is sad. I mean, it's just, these are such trying times. And, and I can tell you that I don't yet know. Um, and I will talk to some of my friends who are, are in the business of trying to help young people understand 
the words to explain this time. It's, I, I think their lives are gonna be marked by this. And I know at home we're all trying to do it in a way that creates a new normal and routines and doesn't cause fear. But of course, kids are very perceptive and they pick up on our emotions and fear. So that's really a tremendous challenge for all of us. And all the while, we don't know exactly ourselves what we're going through. This is an unprecedented experience. And every scientist and every person in the world, every economist, every leader, is trying to find the right next steps, but we've not, we can learn from the past, we can learn from what was it like in, in 1918, um, and it's not a quick road, we know it's a long road, but we really don't 100% know this journey yet. And so we, as the grown-ups, are experiencing unprecedented amounts of a, disruption and unsettlingness, and then we're going through our job losses. And then we have kids who we know are at home that they don't have the stability that they used to get from school in hard circumstances. So Molly, I don't have a pat answer for that yet, but that's something I'm gonna dig deeper on when I saw my friend's drawing yesterday, Matt sent me. Um, I found myself going, what can, more can we do? So I'll, I'll talk more to this as I explore it, and I hope um, the media will help me explore it. But I just want to say to you at home, you know, we will share with you everything we know as we know it. And in this week, we're going to be sharing with you the best we can understand about the road ahead. It's not something I could look up in a book and there's a right answer. It's something that the best minds in the world are trying to solve. But we will keep sharing it with you as we ourselves come to understand it. And what we do know is that this infection will be out there and it hasn't spread to most of the population. And a vaccine that is widely available will be sort of the, the end of this chapter. Um, and we do know that the things we have done have worked tremendously to save lives and that we've given our hospitals the time to start to gear up. We do know that we still have a shortage of PPE, and so we have to be conserving and be careful about our choices. So that is available to the people on the front lines. We do know that we are still far short of testing. That testing is essential for our ability to start to acknowledge cases when they happen, do contact tracing, and slow the spread. And those are all things that are still evolving and are trying to acquire that will get us to a place where we could be a lot more free. And we do know that a new world will be with these new dis social distancing, but it might include a functional social distancing. And it will include probably a slow trickle back to work using the kinds of precautions the governor and other teams and, and businesses all over this world are trying to put in place. And it will include these masks. And it will include us all having to be honest when we're sick and stay home and tell our doctor. And it will have to have safeguards for people who need to stay home and be sick but not lose their job. And some people who are very vulnerable, like the categories I mentioned, will really have to stay more like the way we are than maybe healthy folks. Those are some of the principles that we know right now. And we're going to lay this out and guide you through it. I just want you to know that best minds possible collaborating. But I do want to acknowledge just how absolutely hard this is for you. And it's hard for all of us. But we're going to stick with you on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Your province with the blade. Also a question for Dr. Acton. You've talked about directional trends. And you've, in the past, you've mentioned 14 days as, a, as kind of a period that you're looking right. at. But you've also mentioned that it, China waited until it had zero, until it reopened. That's right. Could you give us an idea of what you're looking for? Is there a magic number? Right. So we're all looking for magic numbers. How much PPE do you need to have? How many tests would you need to have? So if you watch the media right now, everyone is guessing, and the scientists are still trying to guess some of these numbers. What we know we need to see, what's agreed upon, each scientist says it a little differently, 
is that you really want to see a sustained decrease. Ideally, we would get down to the point where we could contact trace everyone. I mean, if we don't have PPE and we don't have testing, then if we could get to a number where when we do diagnose those cases, we could at least respond. That's one end of the spectrum. Some have said a month with each measure staying steady, and I've seen as short as 14 days. Um, we know we won't get to absolute zero because we know this infection is out there. And if you open in any way, and as you're now seeing in China, you'll start, it, you know, when you get good accurate numbers, you'll start to see an uptick. What I am building right now is the ability to have the best numbers possible. And it's been very hard. We still do not know the prevalence of this disease in Ohio or around this country. We don't have that serologic testing. We don't have expansive enough testing. But one of the things we'll be sharing this week in more detail, our scientists are leading us through a study using as few as 1,000 tests done randomly and assorted that will start to give us some numbers. And each day you see our data gets better and people are like, why aren't you giving us this? Some of the data wasn't never owned by the Department of Health. So little by little, we're gathering all the best data we can. And each day, we're going to keep loading up on more numbers we can follow. And we're actually in our emergency control center. We have people with their ear to the ground in each of the three zones in Ohio that will be constantly watching dashboards of numbers. And we'll be talking in days to come about watching, almost like TSA, higher risk and lower risk situations occur. And we want to pick up the second there's a flare somewhere, whether it's a nursing home or a prison or in a neighborhood or in a workplace. And we want to be able to respond and put all our resources in the right place at the right time. So this is a system that did not really exist in this country. And we've been building it in two to three weeks. So it's, it's, it's miraculous in scope, um, but it's still being built. And that's why I'm saying this is a, we, we are like working, working, working to build this out because we're going to need this infrastructure until we've tamed this virus. So we are going to be in this hypervigilant monitoring stage, just like 9-11, until we, we get to a new world where we can truly be, be safe again and get people's confidence in that. And so I want people to feel confident that we here in Ohio are at the cutting edge of every one of these discussions, and, and we, won't, we won't let up. Thank, Thank you. you. Captain Landers, WBNS 10 TV. My question is both for the governor and for Dr. Acton. Uh, Boston University today just announced it may postpone fall term until January. Governor, I'd like to know where your head is about colleges opening up here in the state. And for Dr. Atkin, how, if they do open, would college students be able to practice social distancing if they're in the dorms, cafeterias, sharing bathrooms? How does that look to you? Thank you. Well, I'll start off. I think it's much too early to be making any decisions about uh, fall. Um, I don't think we know enough. I don't think we know where we're going to be. I don't think we know uh, how many tests that we will have. Um, but what I, I think we do know uh, is that whether it's a business, whether it is a college, whether it is K through 12, whenever they do open again, it's going to be different. And, and I think that's the thing that I, I want to get across to people based on everything that I know. Uh, and this is the hardest thing for me to accept. And so I suspect it's hard for other people to accept. But until there is a vaccine, this monster, as I've, I've referred to it, is going to be lurking around us. And so when we start businesses back up, when we start schools back up, when we start colleges back up, it's going to be different. And what everybody needs to be thinking about, and this is to every business out there that is chomping at the bit to reopen, it's to every university, uh, every college, uh, every superintendent, uh, you need to be thinking, how am I going to open? 
What am I going to do every single day to keep my employees safe, my customers safe, my students safe, my faculty safe, my teachers safe? And we're going to work with you on that. But that's something that you should be thinking about right now. Uh, because the when is one question, but how is the, is the bigger question because you're going to open up with a situation that is not ideal, that is far, far from ideal. Um, coronavirus is still, as far as we can tell, still going to be very much here. It's still going to be, for some people who get it, deadly. You know, it is odd that, you know, we look at for the last week and we think there's good news, and it is good news in the sense that the hospital admissions are sort of flat. Um, up until today, the deaths had been not going up much. Uh, but the truth is, we lost 50 people in the last 24 hours. You know, 50 of our citizens died. So this is a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, I still have people who send me emails who say this is like the flu. Uh, I, I wish it was. It's not. And, and so as we all work on this, and we're working on it every day, business is working on it every day, but the real question is, what are you going to do different? What are we going to do different? Dr. Acton talked about, about the mask. Um, you know, we're, businesses are going to be having their employees wear these. It's going to be, it's going to be different. Uh, you know, I can't imagine a business that's going to open up without employees all wearing one of these. Um, many, many other changes. I talked to uh, uh, someone I know, uh, eastern part of the state of Ohio, uh, late yesterday afternoon. I talked to him for a while. I called him up, see how he's doing, how's his business. Uh, his, his is an essential business. It's a manufacturing company. Um, and he told me, I said, well, how you doing? And he went through and told me every safety precaution that they had taken. It was quite expansive. I was kind of blown away by all that he had, he had done. Uh, and so it's that type of drilling down and, and, and trying to be as safe as we can that everyone is going gonna, is gonna to have to do. Whatever your business is, you're going to figure, you're gonna have to figure that out. Um, and so... Long answer, uh, and I apologize for the long answer, but that's what universities are going to have to think about whenever they open. Uh, that's what that's what K through 12 is going to have to think about. You know, how do you, how do you do that? And and it's these are difficult questions. They're not easy. Thank you. Spencer Hickey with Hanna News Service. Could you talk about? You said uh, state agencies should prepare for budget cuts. Could you talk more about how that's going to be and what determinations you want the agencies to consider? And would that include ODH, for instance, given their role in handling the crisis right now? Sure. Uh, we're, we're not going to make that announcement today. Um, you know, we're going to be consulting with members of the General Assembly as we have been talking with them. Uh, but we will in the next few days have uh, announced the, the, what we're going to do. Um, you know, as far as what is essential, uh, as far as what's needed to fight the coronavirus, uh, you know, that, that obviously is going to be uh, a very, very high, high on the list of priorities. You, got to, you have to take care of business. You have to take care of that. So we're, we'll have some announcements in the next few days. Governor Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio and Television State House News Bureau. Uh, a question for you and maybe for uh, the, the Lieutenant Governor as well. Um, when it does come to the idea of reopening businesses and the call for employers to really be thinking about how to keep a, a safe and clean workspace, what kind of efforts are, is the state making to make sure that the supplies are there? Right now, if you go online, if you, if you go to a store and try to find disinfectant wipes and thermometers, it's all wiped out. So how can companies stock up on that now? Is there a plan for the state to help out with that? Uh, very, very important. Uh, 
you know, companies are doing some of that themselves where they can. Um, we are doing uh, what we can. Uh, we have a team that is focused on the personal protection equipment, for example, which is so essential to our first responders, so essential to people in nursing homes who are working, people in hospitals. Um, and so we kind of we kind of break that down of the different things that we are trying to, to get into Ohio, the ventilators and the other things that we hear about on the news and every state is is trying to do. Uh, sometimes that's frustrating. Uh, sometimes that is, um, you, you know, you think you've got something bought and uh, you don't have it bought uh, and it doesn't show up. Uh, so, you know, these are these are difficult, very difficult times. Uh, we have really turned to uh, Ohio companies, Ohio manufacturers. Uh, they, they have stepped up. Uh, they're doing uh, absolutely some, some amazing work. I'll, I'll let John talk a little bit about it. He's been working with some of these companies in regard to what, what they are doing. But Andy, that's, it's the right question. And, and part of coming back <laughs> and being able to have businesses reopen is they got to have whatever safety protection that, that, that they need. Uh, I mean, I, you know, we're working on this, uh, uh, but I, I envision, uh, as Dr. Acton indicated, um, you know, that everybody in, in this state will, will have a couple of these masks, uh, that when you go out, in, out into public, uh, you, you, can, you can use those. Uh, certainly people in, in, in businesses, um, so this is something that I know the private sector is working on, we are working on as well. John, you want to add anything? Sure, Governor. Uh, and Andy, as the Governor mentioned, that's the right question. That's why we keep talking about it, so that we can prepare business for what they're going to need to do to be you know, at the forefront of the, of the restart, so to speak, when that time comes. And uh, it, it is, you know, the businesses of Ohio are really, they're talking to one another. They're talking about what those protocols should be. They're talking about how to source it, how to create the workspace, you know, in your cafeterias and other things that you're gonna need to do this. They're, they're talking about how to implement it, how to put, you know, organize to have a person in charge who's doing these things. But sourcing it is, is a challenge right now and it is, part of the delay in being able to determine when that rollback can occur because you have to make sure that adequate supplies are available, particularly for the most vulnerable workplace settings before you can begin to expand. That, that is a incredibly important part of this discussion and we are pushing through our manufacturers and our supply chains that we can all touch. And we have some amazing companies uh, in this state who are who, who are you know, globally, uh, globally connected to be able to do these things, and they are working uh, every day to help uh, source and, and strategize on how businesses can be prepared. Can I ask a, a follow-up just to clarify something? Um, so, Governor, from, from what I heard, you're saying that you know, the big priorities are the, the PPE right now and the state working on building up PPE, but when, when the need for that maybe decreases, then the state might be looking into prioritizing other things, like cleaning supplies then? Well, my experience in life is the private sector usually can do things better than the public sector. Uh, and so a lot of this is going to be driven by what the public sector, or what, excuse me, what the private sector can, can do, both in sourcing it, finding it, uh, but also in producing it. So, but, you know, we are certainly encouraging, we're trying to help, uh, you know, manufacturers who are producing essential things in the state of Ohio. So, uh, you know, it's it's both the private sector and the public sector trying to work together in public-private partnership, as my old friend George Bornovich used to say. Uh, and when those work well, they can work work exceedingly well. But I mean, every every company's got to figure out what do I need. But there are common things that we know have to be there, kind of basic things. You know, the masks that uh, you know certainly can can and are being produced, uh, and the hand sanitizer. Uh, some of the other things are unique to that particular business. Now, overall, in regard to that, we know we're going to be safer uh, if we, as we op open back up, uh, if we have the ability to do a lot more testing. And so that's something that is within 
uh, you, you know, we have some control over uh, our, our great hospitals in Ohio who are doing a phenomenal job. You know, they're leading the way in this, in this testing. So the more we can help them, the, the more robust our testing can be, uh, the more safer the workplaces can be, the better that we can trace when, uh, you know, if there's an outbreak somewhere, and be able to trace that and, and to quarantine and do all the things that we know that they have to be done. And the government plays, certainly plays a, a, a significant role in that, uh, particularly in regard to the 113 health departments around the state. They're certainly involved in that. Thank you. Adrian Robbins, NBC4, and my question's for Dr. Acton. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Dr. Acton. Um, we're getting reports of people with family members in nursing homes who are waiting days for test results. Are you aware of a backlog happening? And what would you recommend to a family member who's maybe waiting for either their loved one or another resident in that nursing home for a test result for days? <sighs> well, you know, the governor has taken pretty aggressive action uh, to get the word out that there is uh, better testing available if they go through certain hospitals and our labs. So if you can get that information to us, I have a team, a strike force, that's only job is coming alongside nursing homes and trying to get to the bottom of things like this. So I'd love to hear the details on that and we'll, we'll help out. We have the capacity today mm -hmm. uh, in Ohio to get tests returned quickly. If, if somebody is not getting it returned quickly, there is a problem that we need to fix. Um, we, we have capacity. We have six different um, hosp great hospitals uh, that have the ability to test and test rapidly. So if, a, if, if a someone is, it, that sample is taken and it's not getting back quickly, there's something wrong. And we would love to know about it and try to run that down and, and, and figure out what we're, what's wrong. Mm -hmm. We can certainly forward that along. Should families be doing the same thing if it's them waiting for their loved ones test? Send yeah. that to you. Yeah. yeah. Look, I mean, it just, this just look. If it, if it's a day, that's one thing. If it was five days, that's something else. And that's not helpful to anybody if there's that delay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ben Schwartz with WCPO in Cincinnati. Um, Governor DeWine, I want to direct this question to you, but um, if Dr. Acton wants to add something, I'd love to hear it as well. This is a question sent in from a viewer, um, and they're wondering, as we come out of the other side of our statewide shelter in place, uh, curve flattening measure, how will we guard against and ensure that the virus is not brought back into the state of Ohio's communities by way of social and business interactions with those coming in from outside of the state. Well, Ben, uh, once again, you've hit a hit, hit, hit the, the, the tough question, and, but a very, very good question. Um, I, I think that we all need to understand, and this is so hard to accept, um, you know, Ohioans and Americans were used to going in and winning and then leaving, and, you know, we did it, and so let's move on to life. Uh, but as Dr. Acton uh, said, you know, we, we've won a battle, but we've not won the war. And so this, this monster is still going to be with us for uh, at least until we get a, a, a vaccine. So I think the answer to the question is people have to be very, very careful. Um, you know, if you're 80 years old and you have asthma, uh, you're probably not going to go see the Reds play uh, until we get a vaccine. I mean, that's you can, but it, it just, you know, you got to weigh benefit versus risk. And, and of course, that's my example of baseball. So that's, that's what I, uh, you know, want to get back to. But um, so I think that everybody's going to have to make their own calculations. I think what we have to do is to uh, make sure we're doing certain things. People wearing a mask when, when, they, when they go out. Um, trying to, uh, you know, if you have a job, have that company doing everything they can to do the social, not only the social distancing, but doing all the other things that are necessary to, to make that person's job safer. But it's not going away. I mean, that's, that's the sad news. We, you know, 
Most things in life we think we can deal with, but it's not going away till we get a vaccine. So we're, we're 12 to 18 months away from this going away. We're gonna to have to live with it. And, but we're gonna to have to, everybody's either, both collectively as a state, 11.7 million people, state government, plus individuals, we're all gonna to have to make rational decisions and rational choices uh, and not think that this thing is over with. Because when we open things more up, um, you know, people are still gonna be exceedingly, exceedingly careful. Thank you. Tom Bosco with ABC6 here in Columbus. Um, there are some Republican lawmakers who are asking that businesses be reopened. We are starting to see some frustration out there. We've seen protesters here at the State House the last few days. Governor, you and Dr. Acton really have some goodwill built up with Ohioans, but how worried are you that uh, there is a growing backlash and, and there will be a limit as to, as to what you can ask Ohioans to do? Well, I am frustrated just like every Ohioan is. Um, and I understand, uh, you know, that frustration. Um, we have an obligation to get to a point where we can start doing some things, opening up in regard to business. But uh, I would just say this, that if we, if I stood up here right now and said people can, people, you know, let's go do whatever you want to do. If people are still afraid, they're not going to go to restaurants. If people are afraid, they're not going to go to bars. Oh, some will. But the vast majority of people will not. And so what we have to do, if we want our economy to pick back up, if we want people to be able to be employed, we have to be as deliberate and careful and thoughtful uh, about getting out of this as we were when we had to make the decisions to, to close things down. Um, and this part of it is, frankly, much more difficult. Um, but that's what we owe the people. What I owe as governor, the people of the state of Ohio, is a thoughtful response in how we do that. I also owe them the truth. And one of the things, as I've been saying today, is it will not be like it was. Uh, we, it will not be like it was until we get a vaccine. So what we have to do is, is do the best we can. Uh, we've seen some progress, even though 50 people died, 50 of our fellow citizens died within the last 24 hours. Uh, we have flattened this thing out, it looks like. We've got in about a week, um, and we'll see if this trend continues. Uh, and then what we hope is at some point we start going down and the number of hosp people hospitalized go down. Eventually the number of people who die is going down and is going down uh, like that. Um, but so I share their frustration. I share their anger. Uh, I get it. But it doesn't do, it's not going to do businesses any good. It's not going to do employees any good if we get it wrong. Uh, and if we get it wrong, um, we're going to be have a medical mess. And at the same time, we're going to continue to have a, a, a mess in the economy. So the best thing we can do is, is, is get this right, lay out what our steps are. And I've, I've talked about some of the things today that every business has got to figure out, you know, and we'll help them. Our health department will help them. But figuring out all the things that you can do that make it safer for your employees. Because the truth is, if, if employees don't feel safe, you know, they won't want to come to work either. And so everyone's got to feel safe, and we've got to work our way uh, through this. So I get it, uh, but, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to do what we think is right, and we're going to have to do it the right way. Hello, this is Laura from cleveland.com. Um, I just kind of want to follow up, Governor DeWine, on what you were just talking about in terms of the numbers and the data. Um, as you've said, 50 people died yesterday. 
That's higher than in recent days, if you go back a few days. Um, is there anything you can share about the reasons behind this increase? Furthermore, do you, will we well, see like more and more every day until Sunday? Well, well, we hope not. Uh, look, we, we know that, uh, as they would say in the stock market, this is deaths tragically or, 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 or lagging. They lag. Um, you know, your hospital admissions lags, obviously, from where the person got in, 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 infected. But the hospital admissions are, are earlier in the process, and they're probably a better indicator of what's happening. But, you know, we saw it go back up on deaths uh, I, I think, you know, the, the thing to focus on is your hospital admissions. See how those go. Uh, understanding that people are staying longer in hospital from COVID-19 than they are normally. So it doesn't mean your, your hospital capacity stays the same. That, that continues to change. But if you keep the same numbers, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you're going to have more people in there. But we're seeing a flattening of that curve in regard to hospitalizations, which is, is a good thing. Um, it's like any data. It's like looking at the stock market or anything else. Uh, you know, don't, don't look at one day. What you want to look at is a five-day average or seven-day average and just kind of see. And that's what we look at every day. We compare that. You'll see one of the graphs up there. Dr. Acton has it tells you the data for that day, but then it's got the last five days. And that, that gives you the trend, and that's what, that's what we really think is the most important thing. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is Jackie Borchert from the Cincinnati Enquirer. Um, a real quick follow-up. You said 50 people have died in the last 24 hours. The coronavirus website dashboard is showing revised numbers for the past few days that would indicate that there were only um, there are far fewer than that, about five over the previous day. Um, I, I'm assuming this is because the data you're getting, it's 50 more than reported yesterday, but you're applying it to the days that they died. I'm looking for some clarification on that. Okay, Dr. Acton, you, you have that one? No, and I don't have my cell phone here, but I think someone is sending me a correction, so I'll correct it, but yeah. I think it might be a reporting lag not a, so I'll find out, I'll find out, Jackie. Look, I, I will tell you, I get numbers, uh, we get numbers uh, late at night uh, when I get the full numbers in, but those numbers actually switch at 11 a.m., yeah. is that the reporting time? Yeah. yeah. 11 a.m., so sometimes I've come in here actually and been looking at yesterday's number. I'm not saying that's what yeah, happened this time. I'll find out. But I was looking, one time I know I came in here and I was looking at the numbers I had that morning, but didn't have the update as far as 11 a.m. So I, I don't know how to explain this one. We'll figure it out for you. Given the data that we do have, it's been far under the projection models, both Ohio State and University of Washington. The last time an OSU model was made public was over a week ago. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of modeling you're looking at and whether you still believe we're going to peak this weekend? Well, I'll start on that. First of all, thank God uh, the numbers are better than the modeling. Uh, that's number one. Um, uh, number two, modeling is, is what it is. It, it, it is an attempt at some prediction uh, based on the information that they have at, at, at that time. Uh, if you look at some of the earlier models uh, that had the highest numbers and the scariest numbers, it certainly scared me. Um, you know, that was based on, the early ones were based on uh, virtually no social distancing, basically doing nothing. Uh, and every other model, if, when you drill down on it, you know, they have to project what they think the social distancing cut will be. Is it 20% down, 40%, 60%? And wherever they set that, it does, I'm not a modeler, but it does impact what the results are. So, you know, I think that the most, at this point, uh, what, you do, what you look at is the real data day to day. Um, that's what I'm looking at every day. I'm looking at a five day average. I'm trying to see where, where it's going. That's, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with. Um, Governor, I just want to add that um, I received a note here that numbers are being updated at 2 p.m. And, you know, we're, we basically have flattened the curve. And what we're seeing is almost an imperceptible peak, meaning we picture a peak being a point 
and what we're seeing in our numbers of actual cases, so our, our reality is looking like it's flat over a long, I think we're gonna stay flat for a while is what I'm predicting, and we'll slowly, hopefully, start to slope our way down. Um, and so it, I did just receive a note that the numbers updated too. Those were the numbers I was given walking in, but I'll find out if, you know, if that. I also wanna say too that I don't think people should be surprised. Deaths are gonna lag these infections, and so I think, I think some low level of this is what we're going to expect at that steady level. Thank you. I, I can uh, add just a little bit to that. They are on the coronavirus.ohio.gov website under key indicators. So it's under that tab that where you can see those uh, updated numbers, I believe. So that has last 24 hour deaths changed 50 on that. I believe that's the source. Thank, thank you, yeah. I don't have my technology with me. Good afternoon, it's Laura Bischoff, Dayton Daily News. Uh, you all have been kind of describing how a slow reopening might look and how it's gonna be different. Uh, Governor or Dr. Atkin, can you tell us if we'll see minor league and major league baseball games being played in crowded stadiums this summer? And um, do you think the Buckeyes will be playing in the shoe before 100,000 fans this fall? Uh, I don't know on e either one. Um... I think I've said this before, I, I, I told our, our son Brian, who runs a minor league baseball team in Asheville, North Carolina, I told him a month ago, uh, I said, you know, if, if we're playing ball in July, we'll be lucky. Um, but I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. I think baseball is going to, uh, major, major league baseball uh, is, is making decisions. Uh, I've read, read in... Uh, in the Dayton Daily News and other papers, uh, your paper, Laura, uh, you know, about different proposals uh, Major League was having about playing in Arizona or playing, um, you know, in Florida uh, and trying to kind of seal everybody off. But all I know in regard to that is, is what, what I read. I would say that as you look at any kind of coming back, um, that large gatherings of people are going to be the last thing that you check off the box and say, okay, that's, we should be doing that. And again, I think that it's not going to be what the states do, uh, you know, only. It's going to be what fans think is safe. What do restaurant customers think is safe? What do people who go to bars think is safe? What, you know, you go to Reds game, what, you, you think that's safe? And so that is our challenge uh, and the state's challenge is to do everything we can as bit possible to make people uh, feel safe and, and it be true that it be safer uh, in, in regard to whatever activity they're engaged in, whether that's a business activity or whether that is in uh, going, going to a, a sporting event. I wish I knew the answer to your question. I don't. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. Randy Ludlow with the Columbus Dispatch, and I get to ask the, uh, the final queries. Uh, a quick question to Dr. Acton. Uh, doctor, you have yet to sign the order reg regarding notification of residents and family members of nursing home patients where COVID cases occur, and to report that information online. Uh, when will that occur? Um, I think I have not signed that order yet. I'm thinking because I've signed several in the last day, so I'm assuming that the final work is being done on that. L so. lawyer, lawyers yeah. have to be involved, I'm sorry yeah. to say, uh, Randy. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Lawyers have to be involved, unfortunately, so yeah. uh, we love lawyers. So I, am I found myself going back through the orders. Um, I think yesterday was the alcohol sales, so. Okay, but suffice to say, you hope that will be soon, I assume. Absolutely. Well, we've, but we've also indicated that this is what people should be doing, and we, we will fully expect they're going to do it. So, but yes, that will be signed. Okay. Uh, governor, to what extent have you worked with uh, the governor's surrounding states on a regional reopening plan, if it were? Well, we don't have any formal plan, uh, nor do we have a for, any formal coalition, uh, but, you know, I've, I have talked a lot uh, to the governors of Indiana, Kentucky, uh, Michigan, 
uh, talk some to the governors of Pennsylvania, Governor of Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Uh, so the, the states around us, um, you know, we have a lot in common, and it just makes sense for us to share information. And, and it's interesting you ask that uh, because this morning, uh, the first thing I did on my conference call this morning uh, was tell our team, you know, uh, you know, make sure we're reaching out to these different different teams uh, the governors have. Uh, Dr. Acton, uh, you know, is in touch with the health departments of those different different states. Uh, but I told my chief of staff, uh, Laurel Dawson, uh, I said, you know, let's make sure that we're really, you guys at, at your level are doing it. Uh, we're doing it at the governor's level. Um, and we do it quite quite frequently. So I was on a, I was on a call last night with uh, with uh, Republican governors. Uh, you know, I was on a call with the vice president, with all the governors. Um, last Friday uh, night, I had a call with the governor of Kentucky uh, and, and Indiana. The three of us got together on the phone. We 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 were doing that once a week. So uh, we're always looking for good ideas, and we're always looking how to share information. I could add to that, Governor, that the state health directors, I know the Lieutenant Governor talks to his peers, but we're part of something called Region 5, so we have colleagues, you know, we, we get together, all 54 of us, including the territories, but we've helped each other throughout this, um, really learning from each other because it's so unprecedented. A lot of times, um, you know, somebody finds something that works and they share it across, and I think that's very, very important because as you know, we are an interconnected, united states of America, and people, you know, we really are an interconnected world when you're dealing with something like a pandemic. So it's so important that we're constantly watching what's happening everywhere around us, as well as in our state. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we close, uh, just a, a, a comment. Last uh, summer, I had the opportunity to attend the Special Olympics at uh, Jesse Owens uh, Stadium at Ohio State uh, University. Uh, it was great to see the athletes. Um, it was just a very, very inspiring uh, time that I had there. Uh, obviously, because uh, of what we're going through uh, this year, unfortunately, there will not be a summer games. Uh, however, Special Olympics Ohio has launched a virtual program that includes content such as fitness routines, resources for both physical and mental health, and nutrition information for their athletes. Um, Lieutenant Governor and I and Dr. Acton uh, received a special message from one of their athletes. Uh, I'd like to share it with you. Uh, this is from Jessica. Jessica, I'm going to butcher your last name, but it's K-O-M-J-A-T-I. So Jessica, uh, thank you very, very much, and we're going to share your message uh, with everybody in Ohio. and I am an athlete with Special Olympics Ohio in Kahana. First, I want to thank you, Governor DeWine, for working so hard to keep people in Ohio safe and healthy. I know that this, is, this can't be easy, and I appreciate everything that you and the Lieutenant Governor Houston are doing. I also want to thank you, Dr. Akin, for all of your hard work. I know that you are spending long hours away from your loved ones to make sure that Ohioans cleanse the curve. While this isn't easy for any of us, I understand why it's so important that we stay home, practice social distancing, and doing other things to stop the spread of coronavirus. So, from me and more than 20,000 athletes, Special Olympics Ohio, thank you. Jessica, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you compete uh, next summer and all the other uh, Special Olympics athletes. We'll see you all at uh, 2 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you.